Hey everybody, happy Easter. It's great to be with you again, always. I'm, I'm really excited about the readings that we've got this coming Sunday. There's some, there's some good things and I don't know, I don't know how I'm gonna contain myself. I'm so excited about it and that probably means the videos are not gonna turn out as well as I'd like them to because that's usually how things go when I get really excited about something. So anyway, let's, let's jump in. Well, let's pray. We'll offer our opening collect for mass here and uh, then we will jump into the first reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May your people exult forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So that, that was, oh man, that was so good. Okay. So uh, just the prayer, the prayer, the collect. So remember, so maybe, maybe I haven't mentioned this in a while. So we begin our first video each week praying the opening. It's called the collect. It's the, the time when the priest at the beginning of mass says, let us pray, right? So it's after, after the, the opening sign of the cross. Well, so there's the opening song, whether it's chanting the antiphon or singing a hymn. Uh, and then there's the sign of the cross and then the penitential act where we acknowledge our sins. And then, you know, outside of Lent, there's the Gloria. And when, when, uh, when it's Lent, there is no Gloria and Advent, there's no Gloria. And then we go right into the priest says, let us pray. This is called the collect. So he's by, by praying in the Orion, position he's like collecting all of the prayers of everybody that's there and offering them to God on behalf of the people and then when when he's so he's collecting all those prayers but then he's also offering a prayer a, a call a collect which is like all the prayers together offering that so so here right where may your people exalt forever O God in renewed youthfulness of spirit what what I I, I love this what is Easter Easter is all about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead which which means what uh, it points to the reality that those who receive the gift of baptism from him, the sacrament of baptism, who, who make an act of faith uh, and, and, and receive faith, receive new life in baptism, uh, they're born again. Uh, unless one is born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it's like renewed youthfulness of spirit as we celebrate every year the resurrection. There's something about this this great holy day, this great holy season that is meant to bring about a youthfulness of our spirit. Whether whether we're freshly baptized or whether we've been baptized for 90 years or, or whatever, or anything in between, that there's a, meant to be something of a youthfulness of our spirit. You know, even as we experience the the whatever, the decay or the growing old of our body, uh, there's something in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits, our souls, that is, is meant to be always new, always young, always fresh in the Lord. And, and this is what we're asking for, is that, that, that we may exult forever in youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, right? Our, our glory was lost by sin. Now it is restored when we were adopted, transferred from the kingdom of the family of dysfunction into the kingdom, the family where there's a good father who cares for his children, uh, and that, that we therefore may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Well, we already are celebrating the day of the resurrection, but there's also a coming day where there's a general resurrection of, of all people. The, the, the second coming of Jesus, where, where all the dead will be raised, uh, some raised to life everlasting and some raised to eternal death, death everlasting. Um, so we want to rejoice in that, hopefully, you know, if, if we're being faithful to the Lord. Whew, oh, man, that's so good. That's, that's just the opening collect, you know, like that's, that's just it. Uh, gosh, let's, okay, let's get into our reading here. So um, one, one quick note. I, I, as a reminder, the, the official translation that we use during Mass is from the New American Bible. I think it's maybe the New American Standard Bible, but whatever. The New American Bible. That's the official translation. Other, other people like to use different translations. And so if you use a different translation, such as like the Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version or the um, English Version, the, the, there's like a, an, a, a Standard English Version or something like that. Um, the... the the ESV, I think, East English Standard Version. Anyway, whatever. Or, or some other translation, the King's, King James Bible or the, the Good News Bible, whatever, NIV, uh, New, Ameri uh, New International Version, whatever it is. Uh, big encouragement to make sure whatever translation you're using is, is a Catholic Bible. Um, and you should be able to find that by, by looking for, like, here's an example. Look for the book of Sirach in your Bible. If you find it, uh, it'd be in the Old Testament, S-I-R-A-C-H. If you find it, that means you have a Catholic Bible. 
If you don't find it, that means you have a Protestant Bible, and I just encourage you, I mean, the, using it, using is fine, but just encourage you to get a Catholic Bible uh, that has, so Syriac is one of the extra seven books. Um, it's the one that I always think of, but there's also like First and Second Maccabees, Judith, Baruch, um, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter. It does matter, but not right now. Anyway, so so if you use a Bible that's got a slightly different translation, that's okay. You can still follow along, or um, I'm going to try actually, so as I'm doing this, I'm not sure how it's going to work, but I'm going to try to put the words on the screen as I read it so that you can just follow along on the screen if you'd like to. Um, but anyway, here we go. So we're this week in Acts chapter 2, verses 14, and then we jump all the way to verses 22 to 23. Now, I mentioned this last week. This is a little bit confusing because last week our first reading was was the end of this whole passage. So so this week we're reading uh, verses uh, 22 to 33, 14, 22 to 33. And then next week we're reading uh, like 37 uh, or 36 to 41. Last week we read verses 42 to 47 or some, something like that. So it's, it's a little awkward because we already got the end of the story. Um, how they were devoted to to those four things, the, the teaching the apostles, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. Uh, and then, you know, every day the Lord added to their number, etc. Today, we're getting kind of the foundation of that, which is like, who are they and and why are they so committed to this new life? So anyway, so that's that. Uh, we'll, we'll get more into it next week. But anyway, so now here we are, the day of Pentecost, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, 22 to 33. And I'll explain more after we read it here. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. You who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death because it was impossible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Therefore, my heart has been glad and my tongue has exalted. My flesh too will dwell in hope because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. My brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our midst to this day. But since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus. Of this we are all witnesses. Exalted at the right hand of God, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured it forth, as you both see and hear. Boom. There it is. Let's go. Okay, so this is Pentecost. So maybe maybe we know the story. Maybe not. You can peek back a few verses. But anyway, they're praying, waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting because Jesus told them to. The Holy Spirit comes upon them like like fire falling upon them from, from the sky, from the heaven, from the ceiling, whatever. And um, they start speaking different languages. People around them are like, what the heck is going on? They make fun of them. Peter gets up and he's like, no, you shouldn't make fun of us because this is what's going on. Right? And this is like, it's, it's, it's right. So this is his first homily. Uh, which so any anyone who's ordained a priest or a deacon uh, can can think back to his first homily. You know, I can think of my my first homily, and uh, you, you get a little nervous about it, but also kind of excited about like, oh man, this is it. You know, like the Lord has has ordained me, He's, he's anointed me, He's chosen me for this task to to preach to preach the word of God. And and you got to imagine like Peter, like this is it. You know, like the Lord spent all this time building him up. He set. Uh, he built his church on the foundation, the rock of Peter, you know? And so it's just like, okay, Peter, the leader of the apostles, gets up and he starts preaching. Like, hey, listen up, everybody. This is what's going on. What does he preach? He preaches what's called the kerygma. It's a version of the kerygma anyway. What is the kerygma? So so my parishioners are going to be familiar with this, but but maybe not everyone. Kerygma is a Greek word that means proclamation. Uh, what it can kind of boil down to, a, a, a one, one-liner about the kerygma, the kerygma is the basic gospel message. That's what the kerygma is, uh, which a person can present over the course of, you know, a couple of minutes, over the course of a couple of hours, or, or, or even more than that. Um, and, and, but, but anyway, what it's focused on is at the center of the kerygma is the life, death, 
resurrection and ascension of Jesus. The, the Paschal mystery is what we call it. That's at the center of the kerygma, the proclamation of the basic gospel message. The, the, the story is much bigger than that, sure. And and depending on the amount of time that a person has to proclaim, he may or may not leave, or she may, he may or may not leave out certain parts, we know, whatever. But but nonetheless, like Jesus is always at the center of it. And this is exactly what Peter is getting at, right? Like He's like, okay, listen, listen to this. Jesus the Nazarene, right? So it's all about Jesus. He was sent to you by God with mighty deeds deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked in your midst, as you know, because you saw them, right? Like you saw this. Uh, this man, by the way, you killed. <laughs> sad, you know, super sad. Like he came to you by, sent by God to, to do all these amazing things, miracles, signs, and wonders. You killed him. God, in fact, died, right? This is, this is, this is the hypostatic union is what it's called. When, when the divine uh, person of Jesus with his divine nature unites himself to human nature so that this one person, Jesus, the divine person with both a human and a divine nature dies. And, and so we can actually say because of this mystery that God dies. Jesus was killed, right? But what does it say then? Uh, he was killed using lawless men to crucify him, which I, I find just a fascinating thing. You know, like what's the difference between freedom and lawlessness? So, sometimes when we talk about freedom, we think like, well, freedom means I can do whatever I want. Well, Peter actually paints a pretty clear picture here that that's not freedom, that's lawlessness. Lawless means I can do whatever I, what I, whatever I want. I can do that to whoever I want, which is exactly what they did to Jesus. They, there was no law in their hearts. And so they're just like, okay, let's, let's, let's take care of this guy. Let's get rid of him. Uh, but instead, freedom is to choose what I ought to choose. And what ought they have chosen? Well, they ought to have chosen to believe in Jesus. Uh, but as it was in this moment, they didn't. They killed him. But then it says this, but God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death. Why? Because it was impossible for him to be held by it. I, I love that line. Jesus is the God of the living, the light of the world. He descends by dying. He descends into the kingdom of death, the kingdom of darkness. And it's not possible for him. It's not possible for the author of life, the light of the world to be held by death and darkness. And so what happens? The Lord raises him up and brings him back to life because it's not possible for him to stay there. <laughs> Beautiful. And then from there, he quotes this, this passage, actually, uh, which is Psalm 16, where, where it says, um, Therefore, my heart has been glad and my tongue has exalted. My flesh, too, will dwell in hope because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. So this is Psalm 16, which, of course, King David writes. Uh, but, but as he says later on, like, no, we know David died and that he's buried. And his tomb is still here. So, so maybe there's, there's some mystery at play here that maybe David didn't know it. Maybe he did know it, but whatever. It seems like this passage is written first and foremost about Jesus, who, who did in fact die and descend to the netherworld, to the realm of the dead. But, but he was not abandoned there, right? He, he, was, he was brought there by his death, but then God raised him up. He was not abandoned to, be stay, to, to stay there. In fact, our Catholic faith says that, that he preached to the dead, that he descended into the dead to, to raise up the souls of the just who had been waiting for him for centuries, for years and years and years waiting for him. He descended there, but he was not abandoned there to, to undergo the normal corruption of the dead. But as it was, he was raised up and brought back to new life, right? And, and this, is, this is the whole thing, right? God raised this Jesus. Of this, we are all witnesses, exalted at the right hand of God, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured him forth, as you see in here. How did he pour him forth? On the day of Pentecost. This, this is what they're, they're doing. So Peter's like, no, this is the deal. You think, you think that we're being foolish. You think that we've had too much to drink? No, this is what's going on. We have been drinking freely now of the Holy Spirit that Jesus has poured forth into our hearts, into our souls, because it was not possible for him to die the normal death that everyone else dies. But instead, he died, yes, but now he's come to life. Boom, that's so good. All right, now this is the deal here. It's not only that he's come to life. Our psalm today is Psalm 16, the very psalm that Peter quotes in his first sermon in his first homily at Pentecost, the psalm, a response, Lord, you will show us the path to life. It's not just that, that Jesus came back to life, but now he shows us the path of life. He shows us the way to the Father. He shows us, in fact, by, by the mystery of baptism, by the mystery of, of the incredible sacraments that he gives to us, that, that we can be born anew. We can be adopted into the family of God. And being adopted into the family of God, we can experience the same thing that Jesus experienced. 
in, in multiple ways. So first, there's there's this death that when we die or when we're baptized, we are we are baptized into his crucifixion, into his death. But then what happens when we're baptized? We're brought to new life, right? Where we, we die with him, but then like him, we rise to new life and we, we live this new life here on this earth. But then there's also a, an eternal consequence here that, that we will die sh still. Our bodies will undergo uh, decay, corruption. We will die. But, but the beautiful thing is this, that, that even when we die, we believe that we will be raised up because we have been baptized and because we are faithful to the Lord Jesus, believing in him, following his ways and keeping his commandments. And so in so many ways, we can say the same thing to the Lord, right? That, that he will not abandon our souls to the netherworld, but instead he, he, will, he will bring us up out of corruption, out of decay and into the new life, the new life of the kingdom of God. Woo! Brothers and sisters, it's so good. It's so good. I just, I love this so much. Okay, great. We'll see you for the next video. And uh, just keep living. Keep living in the joys of the resurrection. Peace.